Hello, this is Neville Bounds, and it's the Plain Talking UK podcast, episode 379. In uh, this week's show, we learn about the unique way a passenger attempted to board their closed flight. A London airport shrugs off a base closure and insects ground three flights for the UK's flag carrier. In the military, the US Air Force takes a stab at landing some A-10s and Dornier uh, 328s on a public highway. The Luftwaffe wows crowds in Michigan uh, with the A-400M and the Carolinas Aviation Museum gets a big boost from defense aerospace company Honeywell to reopen the museum in 2023, featuring Sully's legendary Airbus A320 that landed on the Hudson River in New York. Well, joining me this week is Matt, because uh, Carlos is unavailable due to uh, injury. Is, is that I right? know, I know. The port that, as I, you, you know it's serious when the wife is the one that texts you to say, uh, is there any chance that you can find some cover for uh, this evening because um, he's not very well, bless him. So yeah, Carlos has got a very, very bad back. So uh, if, uh, if you can, I'm sure he'd appreciate lots of love. Uh, from you all so please do if you've got access to him send some messages and and send him some love because he's he's feeling a bit sorry for himself bless him <laughs> poor chap yes that's absolutely not nothing good. worse well, than the bad back is there no indeed well, i hope he's better soon anyway because that's that's not funny at all no. but uh at a very short notice we have been joined by dear captain nick and it's great to have him back on the show hi captain nick hello peter uk um a delight to be invited back on the show i'm a bit surprised after my last appearance but uh, there you go you obviously got very short memories i think it's all been forgotten and we've glossed over it so that's, that's why I'm, you can come back i'm panicking now i'm thinking i was just like there's gonna be some text messages going backwards between me and john at the moment it's like what did he do when he was here last time i'm worried now <laughs> <laughs> i'm panicking nothing i was the perfect gentleman <laughs> of I'm course sure. i expect nothing less nothing less absolutely Oh, Brilliant. Dear. Well, it's lovely to be uh, on air on time. So I hope this <laughs> continues. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Armando is out again flying charters up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, but he's managed to send in some military stories for our grey enjoyment, which we will have later on. So that's uh, excellent stuff. So what's everyone up to this week? What have you been up to this week, uh, um, Matt? What's your name? Yes, Me? Matt. Oh, yeah, Matt. Hello. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm. Uh, do you know, it, it's just just been uh, just been working, mate. Uh, a bit of weird normality has sort of frequented my life in the mm. fact that because uh, I've been working from home, as many people know, for a company called Naked Wines, um, and they reopened their new office. So in lockdown, they moved from their old office to a new office, and uh, I've been part of the the pilot uh, groups of people who've been going into the office. So I've actually been going You're a pilot to work. Now? Uh, no, no, wow. absolutely. <laughs> no, no. Wow. <laughs> no, I'm a guinea I'm pig. Impressed. I'm a guinea pig in this particular case, but <laughs> it's just like but it it's been very weird slash lovely if that makes sense because I, I suppose we're just so not used uh to sort of going to work and like working in an office and in, interacting with other people and the first couple of days I'll be I've been doing it for about 2 weeks now and it's been I was really nervous I, I, that sounds so ridiculous doesn't it but I was so super nervous the first time that I went into the office and and all that but I mean that fortunately the people that I work with are just really lovely people and uh, yeah it's I'm, I'm really loving going back in back into an office and now Nev you've you've been doing a bit of flying this week as well haven't you yes uh, with, with mixed uh, results I have to oh, say oh dear. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I did a quick uh, trip over to Dublin uh, starting on Monday and came back on Wednesday right it's all going terribly well but I think on the way back or just before we left the uh, dispatching company had forgotten a how to board an aircraft and, oh. and B how to make sure the crew had uh, the correct numbers things like uh, weight and balance oh. and that <laughs> sort of stuff oh quite important then before we went so we sat at the end of uh, one of the runways in Dublin for 15 minutes with the engines burning fuel uh, well that would be the weight what about the balance <laughs> <That's right. laughs> 
quite. Absolutely. <laughs> incredibly, we managed to get back uh, on time, which was a surprise, probably because uh, BA do build in a bit of slack for this 50 minute flight from right. Dublin. They, they say it's an hour and 25 minutes and it's never, never been an hour and 25 minutes in the last 40 years, I don't think. Uh, I, I so. mean, are, are they perhaps sort of uh, aware of the handling company involved, perhaps? Therefore, well, I don't, therefore well there, maybe. But maybe experience is, is in, sometimes in play it's here. their own doing. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. it delay, actually. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Dirk S is suggesting, was it because uh, it was overweight in 1A? Oh, well, that's very likely, <laughs> yes. The lockdown lard continues. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very, Welcome uh, to my world. Absolutely. Yeah. So oh, dear. Back, yes. Uh, with, so. so now, now, Nick, obviously you're, you, you're retired, so presumably you've done nothing this, this last week. <laughs> Oh no! Absolutely nothing. You know uh, me. I uh, <laughs> I used to work very hard, and now yeah. I'm doing my best not to work at all. Excellent. So uh, <laughs> I, I've kept myself busy. Uh, of course, uh, that other show that I sometimes participate when uh, does yes. keep me busy. I have heard of that. Um, yes. Yeah. But uh, there's lots of things that I'm uh, involved in now with PD UK. Uh, one of which, of course, is uh, setting up an interview with a very yes. special person. I don't know if you've announced that yet. I won't say anything in case not but um you know not just thinking about that and uh how we, that's all going to work mm. um and uh, i've also set up a sort of uh a, a meet up uh you know um oh. we have meetups quite regularly i do remember well, them I vaguely yes <laughs> i say that quite regularly they we used only to ever have one <laughs> that was goodwood that was wasn't regular it didn't we, didn't we go to goodwood is that what yes, i'm thinking exactly. of yeah exactly yeah yeah, absolutely. That was a anyway, good day out, actually. So uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. Now things are, are starting to open up and the pressure's off a little bit with regards to catching nasty bugs. <laughs> uh, I thought it was time we all got together again, if uh, if people are, are interested. And uh, this, this time we're going to go to what was the airfield where I kind of started my career, um, Fairex Airport uh, in oh, okay. Surrey, just north of Woking. Oh, lovely. And uh, they've got a little cafe there called the Hangar Cafe. Uh, very original name, I thought. Um, <laughs> which actually is the very building where I got my first job in aviation. Uh, that building used to house the Fair Oaks School of Flying. Uh, no longer exists. But, uh, you know, at least I've got lots of memories from there. Uh, including I flew my first solo in a powered aircraft from Fair Oaks and, uh, you know, uh, worked uh, cleaning toilets. So I'm very familiar with the toilets <laughs> in that building. Right. And okay. I'd keep, keep that more to yourself if I were you. That's, <laughs> that's not a reputation you need. Uh, no, but. no, no. But, uh, you know, we all have humble beginnings. So yeah. uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So if uh, you do have your diaries out, uh, the 25th of September, Saturday, the 25th of September at Fair Oaks Airport in the Hangar Cafe, uh, I'll be there from about 10 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. So if you want to drop in for a coffee absolutely. and a chat about aeroplanes, then please do. Well, I shall do my absolute level best to get myself over there. Uh, Nev, however, has a jolly good excuse to, to, to not be there uh, if things well, go according yes. to plan. Well, let's see how it goes, first of all, <laughs> shall we? But uh, at the moment, the 25th and 26th is the Malta Air Show, but uh, all going fairly well at the moment. But uh, as usual with these things, yeah. with the old COVID business and what have you, who knows what's going to happen. But we are, nothing. Carlos and I are planning to go at the moment. Mm. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But if we don't go, obviously we'll be down at Fair Oaks instead. Absolutely. So, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, excellent stuff. Um, so uh, anyway, in the meantime, I've been a bit busy uh, organising uh, another interview, which we're going to be doing uh, later uh, this month with a chap called Johnny Palmer of Pitch Air. Now, you might remember we were talking about this on a previous episode as well. And uh, Johnny has uh, somehow managed to get this fuselage of a 727 into the car park of his company, Pitch, uh, down in <laughs> Bristol. Uh, we're going to be doing a full interview on it uh, in a few weeks' time when I go down well, there. On the fuselage? Uh, yes, indeed. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, all will become apparent. But let's have a quick uh, preview of uh, what we can expect. Hi, everyone. Nev here in the cockpit of A727, which has not happened before, I've got to say. This one is based down just outside of Bristol at Pitch Air. And uh, I'm going to be talking with uh, Johnny Palmer 
all about this in a future episode. Nice to see some steam gauges back on the cockpit. We don't see many of those uh, these days, but uh, let's go and have a look around. Oh, there's a warning light on there. I'm Johnny Palmer, I'm the founder of Pitch, and I'm the guy that's behind the Pitch Air project. Basically us getting this aeroplane to Bristol so we can use it as an office. As a kid, I always thought, yeah, I want to have one of those private jets. That'd be cool, I'd love that. And I think that when you get this idea in your head, those things often happen, but not as I thought. I got interested in sustainability and reducing carbon and stuff and realized that flying around in private aircraft is just absurd, but I still love aeroplanes. So I ended up buying, buying this thing, which doesn't fly, but is the ultimate in terms of private jets. So the stage we're at with this project is we've gone through getting planning commission, um, done the deal on the aircraft, bought the aircraft. I've got the transport organized, closures and police escort sort of for tomorrow. So now it all just has to come together and that thing be in Bristol by tomorrow lunchtime. No, not at all. It'll be fun. And even if it goes wrong, that'll be fun, yeah? I think he's going to be really excited, even though he had to wake up in, like, six in the morning. My name's Pete Stone. I'm a Rhodes Policing Officer. This is one of many that we've done running out of Kemble. Obviously, Kemble Airport, they get dismantled aircraft and they sell the fuselages all around the world, so it's quite often we get called upon to come and shut the road for public safety. I've never seen an aircraft transported before, so we just watch them coming into Kemble, but never seen one leaving on the back of a trailer. So we're pulled over on the side of the M5 now because um, the police in Bristol had a different route from the one that we're actually working to. So I'm hoping that they can find a resolution to this. Part of the live streamed event we've been doing online during the transport, we've been raising money for the Great Western Air Ambulance, and as part of their training operations, they managed to get their helicopter up in the air while we were driving pitch air down the motorway. We're here today for a Spire Crane Iron. We're doing a um, lift, and this is my partner here in Troy. Right now we're getting the cranes into place. This is the first one, which I believe is 200 tons. That's going to get to the bottom of the yard, and the airplane's going to come back into the yard. And the second crane's going to come in so they can get it from either end and raise it up and onto the containers. They've done a really good job of getting it here, and it's going to look amazing because it's going to be an attraction. It's so exciting. The buzz is just amazing. Are you excited to see the plane? Yeah, I was really excited. What did it look like inside? It looks like What's this for? For like a parking ticket? Or? No, it's obstruction. Obstruction. Um, don't remove the vehicle. Mm. We'll have to remove it for you. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a mental weekend. Lots of stuff has gone wrong. We've resolved it. Hard work by everyone. And finally, we've got it. Super happy about this. Job done. Well, absolutely mad, isn't it? I mean, who would have thought that's <laughs> even possible? Uh, but it is possible because I've been on it uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, talking to Johnny about it and he's very kindly agreed to, for us to do uh, an interview with him in a few weeks time so I'm going back down there with the camera and what have you and it should be a bit of a laugh. Johnny is quite a character I have to say. <laughs> One thing I should mention, this is a bit weird I realise but I was down there with another film crew uh, when I was, uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, so I've arrived and uh, Johnny gets out of the aircraft because he's actually slept on it overnight which oh, I realise is... As you do. <laughs> 
slightly irregular, but that's <laughs> fair enough. And he says, Nev, should we just pop out and get some breakfast? So I went down to the local co-op uh, to buy some breakfast uh, of, you know, all sorts of things like muesli and uh, all the sorts of things Pardon? I wouldn't normally eat and, and fruit and stuff like muesli that. Muesli and fruit? Yeah. This is, <laughs> For I mean, a film crew? <laughs> at least. Anyway, so we, we've got it all back in the car and we've fed the crew and myself and it's all going terribly well. This evening, though, I'm just aware of a smell in the car which has been there for a day or so, and I could not work out where it was. Oh, no. But because it's become a bit warmer in the last couple of days, uh -oh. uh, the smell of bananas in the banana <laughs> oh, was no. getting a bit pungent. Um, and as Sue brought the seat back, uh, it was obvious where the smell was coming oh, from. Oh, no. So uh, that's been in there since the about the 25th, the 29th of uh, July, I think, something like that. So wow. it's a couple of weeks now. So it was a bit ripe. <laughs> uh, it has to be. Uh -oh. <laughs> that's that's one word for it. Ripe is definitely a word. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, well at least it smells authentic now. <laughs> it does nice indeed, right. does it? Yeah. It matches yeah. the colour beautifully now. It does. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wow. So there we go. Okay. No, but I genuinely ca cannot wait for for that. Never. Have, have, have we got any idea roughly when that's going to be sort of teed up and and? Uh, oh well, I'm interviewing Johnny on the 25th of uh, August. Oh wow. So um, I'll be getting the editing machine out straight away, and we'll uh, we'll cut some stuff together. Fantastic. Um, oh, looking forward to that. Yeah, should be yeah, should be good laugh. But, so, so yeah, it's a, a really interesting project, and uh, yeah, I think especially with all of the you know the, the working restrictions and all the rest of it, he's done a mm. great job of this. Actually, well. before before we go into, it, I, I'm just going to check with producer John. Are we allowed to mention what what Nick and um, uh, never up to and the dates and all that kind of thing. Are we allowed to mention that? I don't know. He's he, yeah. We haven't set any dates about when it's going to go out, but but you guys are off to go and do a very special interview for us. We are, and uh, I'm going to let Nick talk about that because uh, he is closer to it than I at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we were. I was going to help you guys out with an interview uh, that unfortunately fell through. Uh, we we couldn't get it done. Um, so I was just, you know, pondering as you do when you're retired and you have nothing better to do than sit in your armchair and drink beer. And, oh, dear. Uh, what I, a terrible life. Yeah, <laughs> I suddenly remembered uh, a wonderful uh, friend of mine um, called Mike Wildman, who I had I met when he was a captain. Uh, oh, I met when he was a first officer. I was a captain on, in Virgin. And he subsequently uh, had been promoted and... Uh, now flies the big jets all on his own. But uh, we uh, went on quite a few trips together and talked about his uh, his, his past history in the uh, RAF uh, flying Hercules and doing a lot of uh, really impressive uh, flying for them, uh, sometimes humanitarian work out in Africa, sometimes on uh, operations in the Middle East. Uh, and um, sadly, I heard that, in, that uh, he had been in a motorcycle accident and... He had an injury that never got better, and in the end, he decided to have elective surgery and have the bottom half of one of his legs uh, amputated. Gosh. Um, this was really because the leg just wouldn't heal. Um, after a long fight, he got his uh, his flying medical back again. But the interesting thing was that uh, he joined uh, a charity uh, and um, called the Barter Bus Company. Uh, those of you with a bit of history knowledge will remember that uh, Barter, the uh, f famous RAF fighter pilot who didn't have either of his legs, lost them both in a flying accident, became uh, a, a fighter ace in the Second World War. And um, as a bit of a joke, his squadron was called the Barter Bus Company. I think that's right. It's his squadron or his wing, because he ended up flying in a, you know, many squadrons together in a big wing. Um, anyway, uh, Mike uh, does formation flying and uh, the members of the team are all amputees. They're all disabled in one way or another. Anyway, it's, uh, I hope, going to be a fantastic interview. Really looking forward to seeing Mike again. He's a lovely chap uh, and we're going to go down and uh, talk to him about his history, his uh, time in the Air Force, his time with Virgin and then uh, what he's current uh, plans are in getting uh, this uh, disabled formation team. He 
it was flying uh, before the pandemic, uh, but uh, this is going to uh, sort of new reinvented team flying yak. So it should be great. So looking forward to that. That is just going to be fantastic. I can't wait to to hear all about that. That that sounds like um, a, a very brave thing to do. Actually, I mean, quite a quite a brave thing to sort of put yourself back out there after something like that. I, you know, really. Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, and um, of course, a lot of servicemen uh, who uh, you know suffer have suffered uh, dreadfully uh, and are trying to find their way back into life and looking for mm. challenges uh, to meet because. There's one thing that you can be sure of. A serviceman uh, is always ready to rise to a challenge. And when you're no longer challenged in life and you yeah. think that your, uh, your, Ill, you know, your injury is going to put an end to your life, it's mm. great to have things to aim for. So I'm hoping that uh, Mike will explain all about uh, what he's uh, doing in that regard. Can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be great. Absolutely fantastic. Well, let's uh, move on. And just firstly to say thank you to everybody that's joined us in the chat room tonight. Uh, just scrolling down uh, as we do. Uh, Richard Adams, thanks very much indeed for joining. Uh, Nick Codling, Lee Davis, Graham Haley, Mazuz Kareem, uh, Rick Bell's in there as well. Stephen Ivey. Um, who else? Uh, Dirk S. Uh, Masher as well. Um, and Rakon and who else? GB's Model Zone is also in there. Thanks very much indeed for, for joining us. And who else? Yeah, Masha, Sturman, and main man Micah has joined us as well. Oh, so Uncle thank Micah. You very much indeed. Absolutely. For everybody for joining us this evening. Very much appreciated. Indeed. So let's get on with it then. And uh, so what's first up? It's, of course, it's the commercial aviation news. So if everybody's ready. Certainly am. Then off we go. So the first story is going to be read to us tonight by Nick. Uh, yeah, uh, I haven't had the check yet, guys. Oh, uh, sorry. Well, so we're, we're just th th 30 days. Payment. Later, later no, yes, yeah, you can say it's payment terms of 30 days, I think. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, check well, the small we'll print. See. Check the small print. I shall. I shall. <laughs> um, this is from the BBC. Uh, so um, it's uh, titled uh, East Midlands Airport Passenger Tried to Board Plane Via Luggage Belt, um, which sounds a little dodgy. <laughs> a man has been arrested after he missed his flight and attempted to board the plane via a baggage conveyor. East Midlands Airport said the man arrived 35 minutes late to check in for his 6.15 uh, flight in British summertime to uh, Poland. The, an airport spokesman said he became animated and annoyed when he realised his mistake at the check-in desk and he clambered onto the luggage belt. The 34-year-old was subsequently given a conditional caution. I'm not quite sure what one of those is, but the Leicester police should know because they did it. Uh, he had been uh, detained by airport police on suspicion of entering a security restricted area of an aerodrome without permission. Well, if he got on the damn rope belt and disappeared <laughs> through the flaps, I think, you know. I don't think there's no we, suspect about it. No, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's any question about it. No. Officers uh, involved later joked with British Transport Police on Twitter comparing the incident to a scene in the film Die Hard. <laughs> Must admit, we were tempted to yell, yippee ki -yay! as we rode the carousel after him, they said. <laughs> Sounds like something at a hot fuzz. Yeah, it, it does, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, this uh, uh, incident was dealt with promptly by airport police and no disruption was caused to the operation. Um, but this is not the only incident of a man on a conveyor belt that Peter UK have dug up recently. A bizarre <laughs> incident took place in Moscow's Sheremetyevo International Airport in Russia, where a drunk man got lost in an airport's carousel network while trying to board his <laughs> flight. Now, I don't know if you realise, but... The, the conveyor belts don't just disappear and stay on one plane. They usually go up, down, around. It's like some vast uh, thing out of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory with um, all sorts of uh, different levels and belts everywhere and things happening. Oh. It's, it's, it's pretty complicated. 
Um, so I'm not surprised he got lost in the airport's carousel network while trying to board his flight. On the 28th of July, a video of the incident was captured and quickly circulated on the internet. According to reports, the individual was attempting to reach the runway by well of the way oh, sorry, of the luggage carousel. However, he became disorientated and wound up on a conveyor belt ride behind the airport's curtain. A man <laughs> walked right into the carousel with his bags before going in the incorrect direction towards the conveyor belt, as shown in the video. After losing his footing, he eventually falls over at an intersection. He also lost a shoe in the process. I wonder if they charged him excess baggage for that. He eventually <laughs> arrived at the baggage screening checkpoint, where he was arrested by security officials. Well done, Russia. It, you, you always top us, don't they? <laughs> Whatever we do, they think they can do one better. I also feel I need to apologise to anyone who's been watching the videos there because he also gave everywhere somewhere to park their bike during that particular video. So I do yeah. apologise. <laughs> I do. I do yeah. apologise if if that uh, that was. Uh, Yes, anyway. I love it. Great story to start the show. Yeah, absolutely. What a, what a lot of fun that is. Yeah, so uh, I think the moral of this story is don't. I, I think that's probably what we need to do do with that. I mean, it's just... I don't, at well, what, what po point they thought that that was going to work and that they were going I to be able to board... I think the big mistake was you, you've got to plaster one of the baggage tags on Oh, your I forehead see. If right. you're going to do yeah. this. Okay, yep. And then once you've done that, all the computers <laughs> will then direct you onto the correct oh, conveyor belt. You just sit there like a lemon. Uh, don't use Pip in the chat room. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, See what you did there. You sit there <laughs> like at 11 and let the uh, all the little uh, doorways open for you. Quite. So okay. If you're going to do that, that's, that's the Then trick. that's the way to, 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 you know, that's the full-on funfair ride. Is if Absolutely. You, uh, I'm yeah. reliably informed <laughs> by Carlos. Well, I'm, I'm, why am I, I can say, well, I, <laughs> like Captain Nick Top Tip, there we are, for uh, fun at the airport. Please don't do it, I think is what we need to know from that. <laughs> anyway, before somebody sues us, let's get on to the next story. Story number two is uh, with Flight Global, and the headline is London's, London South End operator shrugs off Ryanair decision to shut base. London South End Airport's operator is shrugging off a decision by budget carrier Ryanair to close its base at the site in November after EasyJet did the same last year. The operating company Eskin insists it is commercially commercially agnostic to the Ryanair decision. It's an unusual choice of word. Uh, pointing out that its agreement with the airline was based on significantly different economic parameters than those currently encountered. Eskin uh, Executive Chairman David Shearer says that the company will look to a range of other carriers wi with which to build sustainable and profitable passenger growth for the airport. We are in active dialogue with a range of low-cost and flagship carriers where the previously proven route profitability, the airport's efficient operating cost base and the safe passenger experience uh, is likely to prove attractive as demand recovers, says the company. Ryanair has two aircraft based at Stansted, uh, not Stansted, they have quite a few more than two based at Stansted. This is at South End, uh, a reduction on the three originally envisaged in the five year agreement with the airport, but it will redeploy the jets elsewhere to improve its winter network efficiency. But Eskin, which had just reached an investment agreement for the airport, says that the impact on earnings and cash headroom over the 2022 fiscal year will be negligible given the limited expectations for flying during the winter season. For the 2023 fiscal year, it adds the company's management will have time to implement mitigating actions, including cost savings and deferral of expenditure, whilst attracting new airlines to the airport, putting the impact of no such actions at uh, £1.4 million. The ring-fenced funding facility for the airport has adequate headroom to cover any such potential impact, it also adds. Um, 
Shearer points out that the fundamental rationale for Southend Airport remains strong and that its investment agreement reached the Car- with, reached with Carlisle will uh, enable it to capitalise on the recovery of passenger demand, which ex- it expects to occur in summer 2022. Now, I know Ryanair have got, sort of got quite a quite a, a firm reputation, shall we say, for essentially doing whatever the heck they like. Um, but is this perhaps um, short-sighted on their part? Yeah, I think it's a little bit because that base is actually was doing very well yeah, just absolutely. before the pandemic. And um, I know that uh, Carlos flew out to Malta from there, I think, didn't he, with uh, EasyJet. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's actually a very popular airport. And because it's not too busy either, uh, it's got very good, you know, things like baggage handling and check-in yeah. times and things like that. So I'm I'm sure they will be back at some point because um, I just think it's a bit, um, yeah, as you said, a bit bit short-sighted because I think they could do a lot with that rather than jamming everybody into Stansted, uh, probably. I mean, I, yeah, I, I've no doubt it was done uh, for a financial reason. They why maintain two bases when uh, your loads are down so much that one base will serve. And I'm sure Southend will uh, welcome them back with open arms uh, if and when they show an interest again. Um, so I think Southend are probably being optimistic. Um, yeah, they were going to be uh, down on revenue because uh, even if Ryan had stuck around because of much lower passenger um, demand. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I, I don't see any mention of other users uh, diving in to no. take advantage of the space that's now available. No. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, little airport. I think John was just saying in our ears there that Wizz Air is going from where was it, John? Sorry. It was uh, from Bucharest, I say. Well, in, into South End. Into South End, so so Wizz Air is it looks to be sort of picking up some some slots from there, um, but it'll be the only major carrier basically going into and out of that uh, out of that airport. But I mean, I mean, Carlos had nothing but really nice things to say about his experience at, hmm. at yeah. South End, and I do I do feel that you know maybe this is part of the solution, isn't it? To um, you know, like you know, well, I guess. Perhaps things have changed now, of course, because there isn't the capacity issues that there were at the at the places like South at uh, um, Stansted and. Um, yeah, um, I'm just going to throw hang. a note of caution in there. Yeah, if you're a passenger and you go to a nice, quiet uh, airport where it's easy to get through, there aren't crowds of people, etc. That's a fantastic passenger experience, but it probably means that airport isn't making a lot of money because you actually need to have a lot of footfall through your airport to be able to generate the income and once you get a large number of passengers profits go up but passenger comfort appeal goes down so if you're really enjoying your airport experience it probably means the airport aren't making a lot of money Mm. Yeah, fair enough. Well, yes. I, I was uh, contemplating a Burger King at uh, uh, Birch Hanger Services Ooh, on the M11. Steady. Uh, this week. <laughs> uh, and, wow, uh, really I, slumming I it. I did notice, <laughs> because it's right next to the uh, runway at Stansted, uh, how much busier things were. Lots of Ryanair aircraft whizzing in and out of the... Uh, of the airport, and so I think was uh, uh, Ryaning in and out. Oh, I see. Probably not. No. <laughs> see what he did no. there. Uh, it's uh, also, I mean, perhaps one of the other things that they're a disadvantage to here is, of course, Southend and Stansted are really not that far away from each other. Um, and I wonder if that maybe is part of the decision as well. And you think, well, while the while the load factors are very very low, then we might as well have everything going out of Stansted, maybe. Yeah, as Nick, as Nick said, trying to maintain mm-hmm. two bases when yeah. uh, the passenger loads are low is, yeah. uh, is when not there's no need at the moment. Arrival, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry for South End because I, I do feel that you know th- this is the answer, if you like, to a lot of these problems that we've been having is, is sort of trying to get you know some of the smaller bases taking from the flyers. I mean, who, who do we think might go in there next? Hmm. I wonder if the new Fly B operation might might oh, never go. Oh, yes, that's perhaps. a good shout, actually. Something like that. That is a good show. Um, what, what do you think, Nick? I don't know, KLM or something. Do they still exist? Do they still have <laughs> short haul? Um, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. They I still do the uh, Norwich run, don't they, from uh, Skipple? So I know, I yeah, but don't give many ideas because they might not want to, to fly out of Norwich anymore. If no. It's, <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's, I, I, but, I mean, I've said this before, haven't I? Sorry, we probably should move on in a minute. But I've said this before. One of the things that I, I find very frustrating, I would love to use Norwich Airport. I, do you know what? I would love that Norwich Airport ended up being where I went to start my holiday. And then it, I f- say I flew from Norwich into Heathrow, for example, to then you know, go on to wherever it was that I want to. But, I mean, I, I was desperate to go um, uh, down to Newquay uh, and Norwich were doing flights, but it was like 300-odd quid return. Uh, and it was just so ridiculously expensive, you know, and you think that's cl- that's part of the problem, isn't it? Is You know, maybe one of the reasons why they're not sort of, you know, and I know, you know, aviation isn't cheap. I know, I know that's the, the issue here, but... You know, I'd love to see the the regional airports getting, you know, a way of making the regional airports cheaper for people to use, and then they might use them more. You know, and that way, in that would then generate revenue and and you know bring bigger routes and all that kind of thing. I suppose. Yes. Yeah. No, you're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Indeed. Yes, well, moving on uh, to the Daily Mail. Now, this is where I get all my uh, professional aviation <laughs> information from, as, as you know. Don't you mean the Daily Fail? Sorry. That's it. And uh, <laughs> it says that British Airways is facing a safety investigation after three of its jets were grounded by insect infestations just seconds before taking off at Heathrow over a three-day period. Two of the planes were roaring down the runway, because this is obviously the Daily Mail, uh, <laughs> when the pilot successfully abandoned takeoff after realising that vital speed sensors were malfunctioning. A third jet is believed to have been moving towards the runway when the pilots noted a similar error and returned the plane back to its stand. Investigations later revealed that insects had crept into the aircraft's airspeed sensors, known as pitot tubes, causing blockages which gave false speed readings. Similar incidents, uh, similar incidents are known to have caused aircraft to crash in the past because pilots fly by, uh, um, sorry, pilots and fly by wire automated systems can become confused by inaccurate airspeed data. All three of the BA jets are believed to have been on the ground for periods of between three and seven days when the insect contamination happened. Uh, normally, aircraft in storage are required to have special covers over their pitot tubes to help prevent insect insects or dust getting inside. The incidents at Heathrow happened between uh, June the 9th and the 11th this year when temperatures at the airport had soared to 26 degrees centigrade. Not that hot really, but uh, that's the Daily Mail for you. Uh, Creating (laughs) ideal conditions for swarming insects. The most serious uh, incident involved a uh, BA uh, Boeing 777-200, which was taking off to fly to Accra in Ghana on June the 11th. Passengers were delayed for more than five hours before a second aircraft was brought in to fly them to Accra. Uh, the earlier incidents have said to involve Airbus A320 jets on short-haul flights. Uh, yes, not ideal, is it? So, Nick, what happens uh, with pitot tubes? What 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 can happen, and uh, what is the best way to prevent things getting in them and stuff like that? Oh well, I think you'd stick your lips on it and blow really hard. <laughs> that usually uh, clears any insects, and of course, unfortunately, uh, the side effect of that is the airspeed indicator also blows up. But um, no, the the pitot tubes are forward-facing tubes that uh, collect um, a combination of static and dynamic pressure, so the, the pressure of the, for, the air that's coming towards the aircraft, uh, and you, you compare that with uh, straightforward static pressure inside the instrument uh, through a partially evacuated uh, capsule, uh, which is connected by a su- suitable system of levers and pulleys to a pointer on a dial, which registers your airspeed. Now, if, get a little insect crawling down that pitot tube that balance of pressures will change and uh, odd things will happen to your airspeed indicator and indeed uh, pilots have in the past become so confused that they have uh, allowed their aircraft to crash um, it's not just a fly-by-wire thing by the way I don't know why they mentioned that uh, probably because of the Air France accident uh, where their pitot probes were blocked by ice but uh, 
Uh, we know that was only for a few seconds, but something else led to the accident. Mm. Also, so, on the Airbus and I guess other aircraft as well, there's more than one PTAC tube, one on the captain's side and one on the first officer's well, side. Well, on most commercial aircraft, there are three. You have uh, cap yeah, captains on the left, first officers on the right, and a, a third standby uh, PTAC tube. So the chances are of all three getting blocked are pretty remote. Uh, unless the insects are working in a coordinated attack. Um, so uh, what you primarily do is whilst you're setting a power and flying an attitude that you know will give you a, a set speed, you're comparing your three airspeed indicators. Uh, and of course, if you've got two reading the same figure and one of them is wildly inappropriate, the chances are that's the broken one. And uh, you can isolate that or just ignore it and carry on regardless. Uh, you know, bring the aircraft back if you wish and uh, land and have that cleared out. Um, so, it, you know, it's a lot of in, uh, um, a lot of attention was paid to retraining pilots on the basics of this, something that should already have been happening uh, following the Air France uh, accident. Uh, and most pilots now are well aware of the uh, powers and attitude settings they need to fly if they have an inaccurate airspeed indication uh, just to get the aircraft into a safe uh, situation so that you can fault find and discover which is wrong. Um, the, yeah, you're supposed to fit uh, pro uh, covers over these probes uh, but uh, of course in the usual turnaround uh, of a couple of hours there's there's no time really to do that uh, and there's no real usually no real need but obviously in these cases uh, the number of uh, insects that were crawling around uh, you know might have given them a problem i mean i, I guess uh, in lots of ways though the, the, this this story is kind of inevitable isn't it because the these aircraft have never before been on the ground this long have they i mean that that's I don't think this was necessarily the situation. If an aircraft's going to be on the ground for some length of time, you do put all the covers okay, on. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. You, you put all the covers on the engines, you block everything up, uh, and uh, it's a set procedure. The engineers know exactly what to put where, and uh, then you leave it nicely um, safe, uh, and you don't reveal, take those off. And if, if it's been for any length of time, you do a very careful inspection of all the little holes that can get are blocked by over-eager insects, uh, including the pitot tubes, of course. So, so yeah. like um, you know, pandemic or not, this this is completely unrelated to that, essentially. I uh, believe I, so. I mean, it could be a problem uh, when when aircraft coming out of storage, but yeah. if the procedures are followed correctly and everything is tested. Uh, and all the panels and covers. You only actually, the thing that's most more likely to happen, rather than insects crawling down, is someone forgets a cover, right? Or forgets yeah. a yeah, okay. um, and and it blocks it that way. Indeed. So uh, moving on to the next story, uh, Nick's going to tell us about some uh, new uh, engines for the uh, Airbus A three thirty Neos. Ah. Oh. It's a German airline, but yet it's being reported by DerbyTelegraph.co.uk. I bet that's because that's where Rolls-Royce have uh, one of their factories. So Rolls-Royce will be supplying engines to 16 new aircraft ordered by German airline Condor. Um, to be fair, its full name is Condor Flugdienst. I'm not sure I've got that right. Uh, GmbH. The uh, airline has ordered 16 Airbus A330 NEO aircraft, which are powered by Rolls-Royce Trent 7000 engines, designed and built in Derby. Uh, the Condor uh, Flugdienst, I think I've got that right, I don't know. The Condor Flugdienst order is part of a long-term plan to make the airline's long-haul fleet more sustainable and efficient. Trent 7000 combines the technology of previous Trent engines, designed, developed and built at the engineering's giant civil aerospace division in Derby. Uh, Jacques Sutton, or Jackie Sutton, Chief Customer Officer at Rolls-Royce Civil Aerospace, said, uh, We are delighted that Condor has chosen the A330neo powered by Trent 7000. How many times are we going to say that? Uh, <laughs> as it modernises its long-haul fleet with 14% 
fuel burn improvement per seat compared to its predecessor. The, pardon me, the highest bypass ratio of any Trent engine and a 99.9% dispatch rate. I assume that means reliability. Uh, the Trent 7000 will support the airline's ambition to deliver greater efficiency and reliability. Wow, this bloke's really laying it on, isn't he? As it moves towards its t t sustainability targets. Uh, Condor's the latest customer to take the Trent 7000, which entered into service in 2018, has already built a reputation for efficient sea flexibility and reliability, according to the company. Uh, Ralph Teckentrup, Chief Executive uh, Officer at Condor. We're proud to be the German launch customer for the A330 NEA. Thanks to the latest technology and maximum efficiency of the aircraft and its engines, we will be taking off with our 2-litre aircraft. 2-litre <laughs> aircraft? My, that, that's about the size of my Audi's <laughs> engine. Um from uh, autumn 2022, with a fuel consumption of 2.1 litres per passenger. Oh, perhaps that's what he's referring to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Each passenger only consumes 2 litres of aviation fuel per 100 kilometres. Uh, and you can order that on the menu. Mm. But of course, if you prefer <laughs> something like coffee, then I suspect right. you can get that instead. Uh, with our modern long-haul fleet, we will inseparably combine sustainability and holidays <laughs> sorry <laughs> what a thing to say we will inseparably combine sustainability and holidays with condor in the future fair enough uh, we're looking forward to our new aircraft and to a successful cooperation with airbus and rolls royce as strong partners at our side. Now, I haven't looked at the um, Trent 7000. Is it one of their new geared turbofans? Question mark. Yes, I think it is. Yes, and ah. um, there's no doubt about it that the Neo engines that they're putting on the Airbus fleets. Um, I was just on a, a A320 coming back from Dublin uh, um, on Wednesday. And uh, apart from the fact they sound like a triple seven on startup, oh really? Um, really? But it is so quiet on departure and in the cruise as well. Uh, the the cabin noise is so much less with these uh, uh, new uh, engine option uh, engines, and uh, I can only imagine once you put it on something like a three thirty, uh, it'll be fantastic. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm very impressed with uh, with lack of sound on those and obviously it gives the airlines massive fuel efficiency as well so i gather that lack of uh, noise comes from the fact that because you can now gear the uh, front big blades the big ones that go around and create a lot of the thrust uh, they don't have to rotate so fast uh, so previously at full power for takeoff uh, the blade tips uh, would go supersonic and that created that sort of buzzsaw, chainsaw noise uh, ah. you got from the engines. Um, the tip's going supersonic. Now, when you gear the engine, uh, it's just like a gear in your car. Uh, you, the engine can go at one speed and the blades can now go at a different speed. So they don't have to rotate so fast, which uh, means that you're getting uh, better thrust, better bypass, better fuel consumption and a reduction in that noise. Wow. And also, from what uh, the A320 podcast guys were saying uh, the other week, the amount of uh, power reduction on takeoff that you can now have the, the flex takeoff is incredible. Um, so you're, you're taking even um, less life out of the engine uh, in the future, I, I presume. Even yeah, on, my, what, my only question been... for those guys is, do they have a big gear knob now in the middle of the cockpit? <laughs> so you, you go, <laughs> clunk, clunk, clunk. And yeah. Is that how it works? I don't know. <laughs> I'll find out. <laughs> and how many gears does this engine have? I mean, yeah. <laughs> My Audi's got seven. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And a similar engine size. If we go by what we were talking Absolutely, about. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Two liters. Go for not it. Not entirely dissimilar. 
Okay, so we've what we've learnt so far is that an, an Audi engine could very easily, yeah, could get a power an A330. Uh, who get know, a lot who quicker, knows? I promise you. <laughs> Especially if I was driving it. Right. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll gloss over that in case the DVLA are listening, and uh, we'll move on to <laughs> story number five. And this is, uh, I think, this is a great story. This is uh, it's on the BBC.co.uk website, and the headline is Scotland's first electric powered aircraft begins. Orkney test flights as uh, so Scotland's first electric powered aircraft has taken to the skies for a um, uh, from a new test center in Orkney um, one of the twin engines in Ampere's uh, six seater Cessna uh, Skymaster has been replaced with an electric motor uh, and I'm just going to get uh, John actually to pop the video up because there is actually a video uh, there as well uh, but uh, one of the twin engines in the Ampere six seater Cessna Skymaster has been replaced with an electric motor the company believes it could pave the way to retrofitting into island and short haul flights with greener technologies uh, uh, the, it is the first low carbon aircraft to fly at the 3.7 million sustainable aviation facility based at Kirkwall Airport. The uh, plane was built in 1974 but has been retrofitted at the company's headquarters in California after initial test flights in Hawaii. It was shipped to Scotland for its first flight across open water between Orkney and Wick, a 37 mile, 60 kilometre flight. Uh, test pilot Justin Gillen told BBC Scotland it's the only hybrid electric air airplane that I know of flying today. As the airplane is approaching you hear the propeller which is kind of a blade through air sound and then you hear the uh, the throatier sound of the engine with our electric engine you hear the propeller but that's pretty much it uh, on Ampere's um, aircraft the engines are built at the front and back of the cockpit in a push pull design it's the front engine which has been replaced with an electric motor that's a fraction of the size a huge battery pack has been attached to the underbelly which can keep the aircraft running for several hours in the right conditions about 90 minutes of rapid charging would provide around an hour's flight Wow. Uh, Susan Ying from Ampere said that it will fly cleaner, more efficient and more economical. Uh, it will also start as a long haul, but eventually, as the technology is improving, it'll go into medium and maybe even long haul flights. I mean, it's the idea is amazing, I, th I think. This is... This is the future, isn't it? Especially with these smaller island hops. I think, I think this is definitely the way forward. Yeah, and also the things that uh, Neil Cloughley and his team are doing at Faraday as well, mm. up in Duxford, uh, where this sort of technology is, is starting to, to look very promising for those short you know, regional flights and mm. inter-island hopping, as you say. So, uh, I mean, I think, yeah, I think we're doing some more from this uh, technology. I think definitely. we're a very, very long way off from it being a, a sort of, you know, long haul. I think that's, you know, I think we're probably looking 20 or 30 because I think it's not the technology of the motor, is it? It's the storing of the energy required for that distance, isn't it? That's that's all for a long, for, I think for many years to come, that's still going to be the, the stumbling block, isn't it, to to long haul flight is, is the... Yeah, you're absolutely right. You, you've got to have such a vast amount of energy to go for many hours uh, and uh, you just can't achieve that with the current level of technology. Uh, so there's going to need to be a breakthrough, whether it be a hydrogen powered uh, aircraft, um, which I think are very realistic, um, or a new uh, battery um, technology that allows some, a vast increase in the efficiency of the current and weight of the current battery system. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, does I, I, the uh, uh, John's asking, uh, does that push pull design change the way that the aircraft sort of functions in that design? No, that's been around for a long time. Uh, the the uh, uh, O2 um, had a Cessna had a push me pull you with two piston engines. They were flying in the Vietnam War. Uh, in fact, oh, wow. I think uh, Colonel Jeff actually uh, flew used to fly those. 
Um, so yeah, no, Prishwi Pulu uh, aircraft have been around for considerable length of time. Uh, and they have lots of advantages because, of course, uh, instead of having the engines out on the wing, they're in the centre of the fuselage, so they're, they're on the thrust line. So if you lose an engine, there's no um, yawing effect than you get when your oh, engines okay. are stuck out on the wing. So it's a lot easier for them to fly in the event of an engine failure. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, they're, they're definitely uh, a design that uh, is well known. Wow. Interesting stuff. Indeed. Well, the next story is on the executivetraveller.com website, and it's a review of British Airways' new Boeing 777-300ER first-class suites. Well, the latest long-range uh, aircraft not only feature the much-improved business-class club suites, but the new first-class suites boasting sliding privacy doors. Uh, they won't seem entirely new to BA's frequent flyers. The suites are an evolution of those which debuted on the airline's Boeing 787-9 and-10 aircraft, a design BA refers to internally as Prime to add a privacy door. The account is from executive traveller contributor George Budd, and Budd says he's a fan of the first suite's doors, especially as they add much more privacy when the seats convert into a fully flat bed for sleeping. That said, the doors stayed open for most of the flight, other than when people went to bed, as the cabin and seat is uh, private enough anyway, due to the high walls between the suite and the aisle. Uh, uh, BA's new Boeing 777 first suite felt it like felt like it had more room than the doorless Boeing 787 equivalents. Uh, Bud said, uh, "The tray table still folds in half, but doesn't push away as far as it used to, meaning that getting out with the table out is very tricky, even for Bud, who describes himself as a skinny cyclist, a bit like myself." Uh, obviously. <laughs> of course, that's, uh, that's immediately what I think of, obviously. Yes, but yeah, quite. Yeah, I, I, Thank you. I, although I pay money to see you on a bicycle, I'm not going to lie. Let's but... not be doing that <laughs> right now. Um, but it, it also says that the metal edge on the table is much better and the bedside light at head level is recessed and so isn't going to get pulled off anymore. Another shortcoming is the positioning of the suite's video screen, which Bud observed was at the wrong angle and offset compared to the centre line of the passenger seat. And with the screen hard mounted into the front of the seat module, there's no scope to adjust it to better suit your position. Uh, the suite's inbuilt wardrobe is very narrow and only really for a jacket or laptop bag, he noted, adding that this recessed wardrobe is connected to the deep storage of the to the front left. So if you lose something you thought you put in there, it's in the bottom of the wardrobe. However, one of the unique design touches which gave the previous uh, 777 first suites their cosy private railway cabin feeling, the elongated window panels which encompass two actual fuselage windows with automatic window blinds have been replaced by the standard windows and pull down shades. A broader change in BA's new uh, Boeing 777 first cabin is that there are now only eight suites arranged as two rows of one to one compared to the 14 first suites uh, in the earlier 777 configurations. Uh, the space which would usually be allocated to those other than uh, other six, six first class suites have now been given over to a dozen club suites in their own business class mini cabin ahead of the rest of the 76 seat business class section. This affords a handy way to determine if your next BA Boeing 777 flight will feature the new or previous generation first suites. If the seat map shows only eight berths in first, you're on one of the factory fresh Boeing 777s. Uh, well, if I could afford to travel it in that particular class, I, I would try it out. Uh, I have to say, though, that uh, even in the business class section on the 777s, it is so easy to lose things and everything is jammed in a little bit. And whilst it's perfectly comfortable, if you're someone that likes your tech and you've got cables and you're plugging things in and out and that kind of thing, 
uh, there is a high possibility you will lose something normally in the first hour of the flight and then you won't recover it until about hour 11 or 12 depending <laughs> on how far okay. you're going. Uh, but uh, no it's good to see that uh, BA are doing some refurbishments because don't forget it's going to be those premium cabins which will <laughs> rescue the airlines um, uh, with people uh, paying uh, the full whack. I'd like to add though that Richard Adams is saying that mirrored ceilings would make it look more roomy. That is true, yes. <laughs> but that could lead to, well, yeah, uh, yeah, other, exactly. other activities. So, yes, it, absolutely. You know, yes, uh, <laughs> we, We'll gloss over that and move on, shall we? Yes. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Richard. Always, a, always. that's it. Who would have thought Richard would be the one lowering the tone, honestly? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing but trouble, that one. Uh, you better uninvite him to, 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 to the meet-up, I think, Nick. <laughs> uh, well, don't worry. No uh, mirrored ceilings there. Right. OK, good. <laughs> what a relief. Uh, excellent news. Mm. OK, uh, next story, I think, is with you, Nick. Absolutely. Uh, JetBlue begins New York to London direct flights starting at $202. Very impressive. From Bloomberg, just nine days after the UK granted vaccinated Americans quarantine free entry, JetBlue Airways Corporation is making its first foray into the transatlantic service. Starting flights on the world's most lucrative air routes, New York's JFK, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Airport to London Heathrow on Wednesday, the 11th of August. So they've been running for two days now. Ooh. Uh, it's a long-awaited move for fans of the carrier, which has made its name offering affordable, friendly service primarily in the US and the Caribbean. Uh, and it's only the first step in a plan to bring its loyal customers to Europe. The airline is also set to begin service from Boston to London within the year. Uh, in coach, that's the back end of the airplane, uh, it's possible to find a one-way ticket from JFK to Heathrow for as low as $202. I expect there's probably at least one of those seats and all the others are more expensive. <laughs> uh, but uh, perhaps not, you never know. Uh, the greatest asset JetBlue brings to the competitive routes is its affordable business class product, Mint. With twenty, does that mean you get one on your pillow when you get up there? <laughs> oh, I with think at least. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, twenty-four enclosed suites on each of its A three twenty ones. Those seats are selling from about one thousand six hundred and sixty dollars a round trip, which uh, seems okay. That seems pretty reasonable. Uh, even lower than the originally advertised fare of 1979 uh, The airline schedule, which also includes flights to London Gatwick starting in September, offers easy overnights on the outbound legs and midday departures on the returns. The company has hit one bump in the road. Well, they shouldn't be using roads. I mean, you <laughs> you runways and then you're in the air, okay? True, true. Um, even before its inaugural flight, in late July, Chief Executive Officer Robin Hayes said in an earnings call that while flights to both Heathrow and Gatwick would begin on a daily basis, basis in August, they'd be scaled down to four times a week in September, reflecting reduced demand on a route that typically nets airlines a billion dollars annually. Wow. Uh, also a factor, Brits are still not allowed to enter the United States except under certain extraordinary circumstances. Mm. Now, uh, now may seem an odd moment to launch uh, a service in a travel corridor that's not yet fully opened, but the opposite might be true. It's widely acknowledged that the slots JetBlue received at Heathrow were the result of other airlines' pandemic flight cuts, explained Edward Russell, who are reports on airlines for Skift, whoever they are. This makes good business sense for an airline, he continues. Once you get your foot in the door, in a long-sought market, it's easier to stay there than try and begin flights once air travel recovers. He has a point. I don't suppose these slots they've got, though, are jet blues to have uh, forever. I suspect they're um, On loan. paying another airline to give up yeah. slots or loan them slots. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, uh, I mean, no. I mean, how long do we think it will be before before the corridors open? I mean, I I I my I feel like it's imminent. Do you? you I, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I, my gut feeling is like that. It, you know, hopefully it's imminent. But... Uh, I, I, it's going to happen slowly uh, because uh, each country has its own problems yeah. with bringing people in who might be infected. I think the UK will be uh, open both to go to other countries uh, and uh, bring people in because we're well ahead of the drag curve on mm. vaccinations. Uh, yeah. America, not so. Um, you know, they, they're still way down in the 50% areas mm. and there are certain areas of the country where it's well below that. So uh, it is interesting. Uh, there's mm. certainly for those who, who are vaccinated and will be allowed to travel freely, this will provide an inexpensive way. Uh, and if the business class product is as good as is suggested, then uh, I think it'll be very popular. But this is not the first time we've seen uh, low-cost competitors try to get a foothold mm. in on this these particular routes, yeah. and many of them have come um, come on know, come adrift. Yeah, yeah they they failed indeed. Uh, when compared with the bigger how, boys, um, how challenging it is for the cabin crew to operate, uh, you know, seven or eight hours worth of flying on a single aisle aircraft uh with a with a full load um yeah that, that, that is one of the big drawbacks uh you know the whole reason we've got wide bodies is because on long haul flights you've got much more room to move about mm. you know when there's a food service going on you don't necessarily block both aisles you can still get across to the toilets uh, and things uh and uh, you just don't feel nearly so cramped uh, the a321 is not a big airplane Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, if if you're willing to, if, if you know you're a slight or slight um, st structure, not like me, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you're willing to take a little bit of discomfort, then it may be well be worth the money to you. I mean, for me, as a as a definitely not a slight individual, uh, there's no two ways about that. Um, it, it, the the appeal to me, you know, especially through this. I mean, I've made so many friends in the states. the The idea of being able to go to the states for a couple of hundred pounds is really exciting to me. If you see what I mean, absolutely. So, you, but, know, you, know, you know, and I'm it's willing to put be up with seven a, hours of torture. Heck, for if you're down the no, back. that's fine though. I, I I'm literally I, I would even go on a seven five seven if it meant I could go for a couple hundred quid. That's how how much I, I want to do it. There you are. You heard it. You heard it here first, people. Uh, okay. Micah's got an interesting idea in the chat room. He's saying, I believe that JetBlue will be be will only be low cost for a while as they develop a customer base. I can't imagine it will continue. Um, it will continue. Well, uh, that as that's such. been yeah. the traditional way that um, new new airlines to a market get in. They offer rock bottom prices, mm. but once they get established, then you'll find their prices will creep up to match all the other airlines that are flying on that route, and that that is inevitable. So, these these opening prices, uh, grab them while you can. They may not be around for long. So essentially, I've got to do it now. Is what the uh, also uh, uh, Nev? I wonder if I could have your attention for a very brief moment here. And this is what I love about it when John gets all the pictures. I don't know if you noticed this in this particular picture here, this particular seat. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> look at that. I mean, that's attention to detail, isn't it? He's found it Nev's seat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that that's, that looks like a nice place to be. Um, but of course, that, that is the business class. Fair, isn't it? I would imagine. I guess. Uh, I guess. So that's but, true. Um, yeah. You know, I, and I think that, um, as Nick was saying, the, these these, to be honest with you, with what's happened with the pandemic, you can't blame airlines for trying something no. new, uh, because you know they they've just got to get back to some kind of revenue earning and profitability. Now they're not going to do it at selling um, flights at two hundred pounds or two hundred dollars each. Uh, it's going to be the premium cabins that that make their return or, or help them get back to normal mm -hmm. but i think on the you know those eastern seaboard flights from jfk um back to the uk offer some interesting alternatives to to the regular 
know, the triple sevens and the Dreamliners and all the rest of it, uh, and may be priced according, accordingly. And actually, you know, a brand new A321 uh, LR or XLR, whichever it is they, they run on that route, you know, it's a, a pretty nice aircraft. Um, but I would only want to be on that normally, I would say, for a trip down to the Canary Islands, you know, a four hour yeah. trip, not necessarily a seven or eight hour one. But, yeah. Uh, it's um do do you, do do you think that might actually sort of play into customers minds perhaps though if they are are planning that i mean as i say i mean i i'm saying that i you know because I, i'm so desperate to go to the states i'd be willing to sort of put up with an alarming amount of discomfort but uh, may, might i be in the minority here well, it depends, isn't it? How, how how important it is for you to get to your destination and, True. and what you will put up with. <clears throat> and I'm sure they'll, the, the JetBlue will have lots of phone calls to their offices uh, when people are trying to choose their seats and going, well, I've only got, uh, you know, one aisle and, and two sets of seats. Where, where's, where's the other bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, True. So, uh, yeah. but uh, we'll have to see. But uh, this is the first time, apart from, I think I'm right in saying the 757 in recent years, where there has been, will be single aisle transport across the North Atlantic. True. Um, so, that is true. And see. we know that no. that is not a particularly, uh, uh, you know, happy environment for a passenger. Um, no, seven, no, agreed. Five experience agreed. is yeah. not really top of anyone's list. <laughs> no. no, no, that's true. Uh, and although, as I say, although part of me is kind of hoping that maybe JetBlue could get get some kind of carriage deal to sort of go, you know, to go London to to Dubai because that's another place I'm desperate to get to very any sometime very soon. But uh, well, yeah, for two. That, uh, well, that really uh, is uh, that's really stretching it. Again, yeah, because uh, you know you need you mean? They can't freedom do... rights to be able to do that. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, fair enough, <laughs> fair enough. And they'd uh, have to re- uh, they'd yeah. have to rename the aircraft rather than XLR, probably FLR, right? Uh, okay. Instead to, to get that far. <laughs> okay, uh, a good reason. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I did. I mention I'm not very good at this rubbish. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to the next story. Being shouted at by John in my ear now. I'm in lots of trouble. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the uh, businesstraveller.com is the website. And the headline is EasyJet introduces uniforms made from recycled plastic bottles. EasyJet has announced plans to roll out new cabin crew and pilot uniforms made from recycled plastic bottles. The carrier says that the partnership with Northern Ireland-based manufacturer Tailored Image will, pre- will prevent over half a million plastic bottles from ending up in landfill or oceans each year or 2.7 million bottles over the course of the five-year contract. The uniforms, which will go uh, into cabin crew circulation this month, are each made from around 45 bottles and have a 75% lower carbon footprint than traditional polyester. Uh, the uh, oh dear polyester oh, I, am, I, I I suddenly I feel very sorry for the, uh, the the cabin crew there perhaps it's just in the trousers let's let's hope it's just in the trousers uh, EasyJet said that the fabric had been adapted to the airline's current style and was trialled last year to check its suitability in cabin and flight deck environments the airline said that it had been found to be more abrasion resistant than its non-recycled alternative and provides even more elasticity uh, a four-way stretch improving fit and freedom of movement for enhanced comfort and durability and also for perhaps the uh, slim possibility that some cabin crew like the rest of us mere mortals have put on a little lockdown weight uh, in uh, addition to who am I kidding cabin crew never put weight on honestly Uh, in uh, addition all plastic clothing related packaging has been replaced with recyclable and biodegradable materials including collar strays uh, shirt clips and shirt covers EasyJet said that the move builds on other steps already introduced to reduce plastic on board including offering a 50 pence discount on hot drinks for customers who bring a reusable cup now i must admit i do that uh, a lot i i have my costa coffee cup that i take to uh, when i when i pick my costa coffee up when i'm out and about so uh, i think and a lot of people are, are sort of um very good about doing that now aren't they where they've got their uh, that where they're carrying their, um, you know, sort of like coffee cups and stuff. I think this is a great idea, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, uh, it, it's quite it's quite a thing, isn't it? Because a lot of people now are, are creating clothing using um, using like re- recycled plastic and stuff. And it, I mean, it saves it going to landfill. I guess it's great, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not too sure about the uh, reusable cup 
trick uh, because that could end up shooting them in the foot because uh, the weight of every passenger bringing a metal mug uh, uh, compared with um, paper cups is going to be considerable. Uh, so, you know, that True. means you're going to have more fuel consumed, etc. I mean, even the weight of newspapers on board an aircraft, uh, if you, you know, combine that extra weight throughout an entire year's flying and calculate the amount of extra fuel it takes to carry them, you suddenly realize, oh, we want lightweight paper on our newspapers, etc., etc. Uh, so you know, even that little bit will make a significant uh, difference. I hadn't, I hadn't even thought that. It was. Uh, uh, I, I don't. Uh, John, John's asking the question. Actually, was it because they were they recycling their own stuff? I don't think they're actually. I, from what I recall, when I was doing the research on this story, yes, I know that's a shock. Uh, uh, it was from general recycle recycle bottles, not specifically from. Ryanair's own, uh, not Ryanair, uh, EasyJet's own um, bottled waste. Um, although it's part of their, you know, it's part of their plan is to, to you know, make sure that the recycled plastic doesn't go into landfill or, or anything like that. So, uh, no, I, I understand it's from, you know, generic um, bottle uh, waste that the clothing is being created from, not specifically uh, EasyJet's. There we go. But I'm all a fan of recycling. So Absolutely. if they can make uniforms out of it, great. I'm worried about the crew getting hot and sweaty. But yeah, uh, you know, yeah. we'll wait and see. Yeah, indeed. Agreed. Uh, it, it is an issue, I'm sure. But uh, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, as they say. <laughs> Absolutely. Indeed. Are you going to eat your uniform? Yeah. <laughs> Depends on how hungry I am, Nick. Uh, yeah, good point. <laughs> okay, on to the next story then. Um, All right, then. This is uh, Virgin Galactic to sell spaceflight tickets starting at $450,000 a seat from The Guardian. Uh, they love Richard Branson, I'm sure. Uh, Virgin Galactic has opened sales uh, for the public to buy a ticket to space. Now, there's a certain amount of um, debate as to whether uh, this aircraft actually goes into outer space or not. Um, with seat, seat prices starting at 450000 uh, just a few weeks after the company's billionaire founder, uh, Dick Pickle, oh, I'm sorry, I misread that, Richard Branson, <laughs> took a high-profile flight to the edge of space, just ahead of his space tourism rival, Amazon's Jeff Bezos. Uh, Virgin said on Thursday that it's making progress towards beginning revenue flights next year. It will sell single seats, package deals, and entire flights. <laughs> what, why don't you don't buy an entire flight? Do they chuck you out halfway? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Well, if they don't actually go to space, it's less of an issue. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, Branson soared uh, 55 miles, 88 kilometers, above the New Mexico desert from Virgin Galactic's remote base, where it has been developing and testing its pa passenger space flights. In a suborbital flight above, uh, sorry, aboard the company's special rocket plane on the 11th of July, after experiencing a short period of weightlessness, Branson safely returned to Earth in the vehicle's first fully crewed test flight to space, a symbolic milestone for a venture he started 17 years ago. In June, Virgin Galactic received approval from the U.S. Aviation Safety Regulator to fly people to space. Sales will initially open to the company's significant list of early hand raisers, it said. Uh, the company said it will have three consumer offerings. I think we've covered that. Single seat, multi seat and a full flight buyout. Uh, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos held his own arrival rocket flight just days after Branson, make, marking a new era in space tourism fueled by competition between billionaires. Yeah, Elon Musk, SpaceX, has already become a key partner in the U.S. space agency, NASA. Now, Elon Musk is certainly the bloke that has really uh, made a mark in this market. I think uh, all the other ones are just, um, you know, just having a bit of fun, uh, quite honestly. Uh, Virgin Galactic's next space flight is scheduled for late September in New Mexico with the Italian Air Force. Oh, the Italian Air Force? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Virgin Galactic announced the offerings as it uh, uh, reported Thursday that it had lost uh, $94 million. Uh, how careless of them. 
uh, in the second quarter on soaring costs for overheads and sales. Company posted revenue of uh, 571,000, barely enough to cover one seat on a future flight. Um, very interesting. Of course, this is slightly different to the other thing that uh, Virgin Galactic offer, which is launching a satellites from its 747, where they sling the rocket under the wing and get up into the uh, upper atmosphere and then fire it from there, where, of course, you need much less power to uh, you know escape, get through those first few uh, thousands of feet. Uh, so it saves a lot of... Um, uh, rocket fuel i mean i'm sort of excited that uh you know <laughs> yeah the debate about whether he went into space or not is is going to rumble on for for years and years um so yeah i, I don't know I, i'm pleased that he you know he he feels he's achieved a, a lifelong goal i guess that's that's the main thing here isn't it he's the billionaire after all he can do what he likes uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, he's already had, always had this yeah. um, side of him that likes uh, messing about and uh, trying exciting things, whether it be the blue ribbon crossing of the Atlantic in his uh, vast um, uh, speedboats, um, ballooning around the world, his attempt for that, where he was uh, beaten by a competitor. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's already always enjoyed this kind of mm. adventure um, travel. Uh, this is, I think, just the ultimate, really, to go into uh, space. Um, and if enough people are willing to fork out enough dollars, there are plenty of billionaires out there. Yeah. I'm sure I'll be able to fill the aircraft for a year or two at least. Uh, I mean, do you fancy it, Nev? I'm terribly sorry, but this does not <laughs> excite me in the sun. No, slightest. really? Oh, OK. And I don't see the point of it either. Yeah, and... Yeah. Um, I'm not a massive environmentalist by any stretch of the imagination, um, but um, I can only imagine the kind of fuel burn that goes on with these things <laughs> yeah. to, to get them into that sort of, um, you know, lower orbit uh, area yeah. and that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I can't deny that it's a technical, technological, you know, very interesting piece of work, but I, I've yet to see the point of it but of course if we fast forward you know 100 years or something uh my uh my whole skepticism may be proved wrong well in 100 years time also it may it may be more relevant i guess at the moment yeah. it feels like this isn't something that's relevant uh lee davis was saying a moment ago that uh, bargain i'll have two uh, uh dirk, dirk is <laughs> asking the ultimate question for you now is it perhaps because there isn't a seat 1a available on the virgin spaceship perhaps that's, that's it. I'm, all, I'm all bitter and yeah. twisted already yeah <laughs> right. absolutely uh there we go uh are you saying that virgin is not going green Oh, oh! Now there's a th thanks, Captain Captain Rick. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. oh, I tell dear. you an interesting thing. At least the Virgin uh, spaceship had a couple of pilots, whereas I think um, Jeff Bezos's uh, was all automated. Oh, you just oh. sat in a tin can, got fired up, uh, and floated back down again, <laughs> all under automatic control. I mean, I mean a, a, as a, a regular user i find that frankly quite nerve-wracking that jeff bezos is involved in something that's totally automated if he's <laughs> is anything to go by but perhaps that's just my perhaps it's just my silly british accent who knows i, I don't know but uh, there we go right shall we move on to the final story in the commercial then yeah this is a, a great story and one that i like because i've flown this airline so many oh, times wow. Uh, when I worked in uh, Sweden for nearly 12 years uh, back in the uh, wow. back in the 90s, and uh, I used to fly SAS exclusively uh, all around Scandinavia and to and from London as well. And it's on the Forbes.com website, and it says that 75 years ago this year, Scandinavian airline system SAS completed its inaugural uh, intercontinental flight from Stockholm to New York. Uh, since then, the airline has achieved many aviation milestones, including the first round-the-world service to fly over the North Pole, introducing uh, the first electronic reservation system and employing the world's first female major commercial airline pilot. Uh, 
Well, in 1948, SAS was formed as a collaboration between three domestic airlines in Denmark, Norway and Sweden. Uh, det Danske Luftfart uh, Selskab, uh, Det Norske uh, Luftfart Selskab and Svenska uh, Intercontinental Lufttraffic AB. Uh, the airline began, uh, began long-haul international flights from the three countries and soon added a European network with the addition of Swedish flag carrier uh, uh, AB Aerotransport. Uh, in 1952, SAS experimented with the flight over the North Pole. A Douglas DC-6B completed the journey from Los Angeles to Copenhagen via stops in Edmonton and Greenland in 28 hours. Two years later, after approval by the US authorities, SAS launched scheduled services over the North Pole, which would prove popular with American tourists. In 1959, SAS entered the jet age. The French-built Sud Aviation Caravelle entered service, soon followed by the Douglas DC-8. Uh, in 1969, oh, why does it, why does OneNote decide to do an update just as I'm about to read something? <laughs> oh, <out> no, <laughs> that's not very helpful, is it? Um, you might just have to carry on. Uh, um, okay, Matt, if, yeah. if you, okay, if you yeah. can bear with Matt. me. Oh, okay, sorry. so um, yes, in 1969, he's just sorry. I'm having to switch between pictures and stuff. John, uh, John's going to have to 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 take over here. There we go. So in 1969, Turi uh, Wilderow uh, completed her first scheduled flight as. As first officer of a scheduled SAS flight on a, a Con Convair uh, 440 Metro liner. She was the first woman pilot for a major uh, Western carrier. Her father, uh, Vigo Widero, uh, founded the Norwegian domestic airline uh, Widero, which still flies today. In, 19, in the 1970s, the Boeing 747 joined the um, uh, SAS fleet, offering new levels of capacity and comfort, but the airliner would ultimately prove to be too big and uh, to be economically viable uh, to and from Scandinavia. SAS often turned to renowned des designers for its crew uniforms. Popular uniforms included the colourful Carven summer uniform of the 1960s and the elegant turquoise Christian Dor uh, winter uniforms of the 1970s. I've now caught up, so I can okay, continue it lovely. if you do, wish. Do uh, please well, do. <laughs> uh, well, SAS has used many different aircraft over the years. Uh, as a smaller alternative to the Boeing 747, the airline turned to the McDonnell Douglas DC-1030. And in 1989, SAS Commuter was established, which required an investment in smaller Fokker 50 aircraft. In fact, they had a huge fleet of uh, MD-81s, 82s, 83s and MD-87s, which they used on their entire domestic and European routes. And they were very popular aircraft indeed, as long as you were sitting near the front or about halfway down, because the rear mounted engines were particularly noisy, I have to say. Uh, oh, really? But, um, in the face of stiff price competition from Norwegian, though, uh, SAS only just avoided bankruptcy in the 2010s. However, the financial turnaround was remarkable, but then the coronavirus crisis grounded much of the airline's fleet for more than a year. Well, in the autumn of this year, SAS completes the resumption of its full long-haul route, a, a network between the US and Europe, and the recent failure of Norwegian's long-haul operations has ensured significant demand for SAS services, but the airline will soon have to deal with new competition in the form of Norse Atlantic Airways. And of course, SAS now, apart from operating the 330 and 340, have got a nice uh, brand new fleet of uh, A350 Airbuses as well. So, uh, no, good for them. They, they've really gone through some some difficulties in the past as well uh, with uh, multiple pilot strikes back in the 80s and 90s but uh, it was always a, a great airline to fly and I, and I really enjoyed it I must say um, so uh, yeah really good really good stuff to see uh, see that they're 75 years old I know it's almost unbelievable isn't it it's sort of 75 to think that aviation has been you know commercial aviation as we know it has been around for sort of 75 plus years now it's it's such a such a frightening number <laughs> it's so yeah yeah, yeah. and Indeed. they're pretty handy if you need an embassy storming as well right yeah, okay. that's right yes <laughs> very much so <laughs> okay good to know thanks for that uh, <laughs> 
And that is uh, where we bring the commercial segment to a close. Now, I think we're going on to the Caption This competition. Is that mm. all? Well, not yeah. competition. I mean, the competition is is amongst yourselves. There's no prize. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, indeed. That's why we don't call it caption competition. I'm just being t- I'm being told off again. Honestly, oh, it was lovely. I had a week off last week. Oh dear. Uh, right, uh, Nev, I'll, I'll let you take charge if I may. We've got the the picture. Uh, how's best to describe this picture? Let me pop it up for you. So it, it, this uh, this competition is run on Facebook, isn't it? Or not competition? I keep saying the word competition. The caption this uh, is on our Facebook page. So if you don't follow our social media, then please do so. Uh, just search your social media platform for plain talking uk and you'll find it and this is the picture now how, how would we describe this nev well we normally talk about uh, pushback tugs and uh, carlos and i did an interview <laughs> uh with the fellas um in dubai who, who the, the german company that, that makes the ones that are at uh, heathrow t5 but this is taking it to a new level i think isn't it uh, judging by the picture here so uh, <laughs> uh jake says uh his entry is that south end airport has had to make cutbacks since hearing ryanair was leaving the- <laughs> i like it uh, daniel says uh, going green uh, is is the caption for that one? Uh, have you got the captions in front of you, Nick? Absolutely, and that was a good APG one. I thought <laughs> uh, James Quite. said, uh, uh, and we haven't actually described it for the audio people, have we? It's a it's a bin liner with a tow bar, <laughs> and on the front of the tow bar is a little tricycle. So uh, um, it looks like it's going to be pedalled along. Right. Um, James says, a fresh off the plane from Tokyo, and the US Olympics team have already started training for Paris 2024. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like that one. <laughs> Uh, Dari says there's too much equipment. All that's needed is a healthy set of teeth. And uh, you can actually go to uh, a website on metro.co.uk, which says strongman pulls 50 ton commercial plane using just his teeth. Uh, we'll put a link for that in the in the show yes, notes. Yes, I should stress that's obviously not manufacturer recommended. I should stress. No. Uh, John is saying UK cycling reveals secret training method that led to Olympic success. <laughs> and what great success it was too and Agreed. Stuart says pedal to the metal or should that be plastic <laughs> yes uh, Sandra says uh, cutbacks by airport management mean that they've had to downgrade their tug vehicles however the drivers will become very fit and strong good point well made uh, Daniel says United's ramp agents new cycle to work scheme <laughs> <laughs> Uh, David says, uh, Ryanair's latest cost-cutting measures. Oh, classic. (laughs) And uh, finally, Steve says, uh, Bangladesh uh, Bangladesh authorities show off its all-new high-capacity wide-body cycle rickshaw. Quite. Yes, I mean, you get a lot of people on board that, wouldn't you? Now, I mean, I I have an obvious question here, and uh, uh, I'm assuming, obviously, this is some kind of stunt, but would that actually work? I mean, would it? I mean, surely the wheels would just spin. <laughs> the t- surely you well, wouldn't be able to pull it. I, I'm thinking of, of of the torque and power required to even uh, get it moving to to begin with. Well, quite. With, uh, yeah. You know. yes. um, well, okay. uh, I mean, airliners have been known when they're incorrectly chopped to set off on a very gentle incline on a ramp. Um, so it doesn't take much uh, to keep it going but getting it going is the nightmare is and the... if you get, get a bit of a lump or a bump and yeah True. I mean, you're looking okay we've got a few from the chat room so uh we're going to get those popped up on screen oh, now yeah. okay I like Lee Davis <laughs> so uh Richard Adams is saying tricycle undercarriage I Very like good. that. Yeah. <laughs> May May uh, Micah is saying that picture should be titled confidence. <laughs> mm. Quite. Absolutely, Dirk S. Uh, new Ryanair saving measure measures. Uh, passengers can even save some money by booking this specific seat. Uh, <laughs> I like, quite like that one. Uh, Lee Davis is saying all you need is the GB Track Cycling Team. I think that's a good point. Uh, Deliveroo has gone very upmarket. He's also offered. That's the one a... I like. I think it's really <laughs> good. Lee. Some very some good. show called APG says scraping the bottle of the co-host's barrel. Oh dear, that's a bit rude. <laughs> Scraping the bottom of your barrel. Yes, indeed. Never mind. Uh, (laughs) Thank you very much. Uh, Rick Bell saying Sir Richard Branson's entrance to Spaceport America was really training for this moment. 
<laughs> I quite like that one. Yeah. Oh, I see. Cycled. Right. I see. Cycled into say spaceport. Sorry, I can't read. It seems. Uh, right. Okay. I think uh, we should just take a very quick break, and we'll be right back after this short message. Well, uh, welcome to our London studios. Uh, welcome to the A three twenty lounge uh, webinar. Uh, tech presentation, um, obviously for the 320 series. Welcome to the Year 320 and 737 Lounge, bringing technical refresher courses directly to you. Using our cutting edge broadcasting facilities, enjoy a fully interactive technical refresher course from the comfort of your own home. All of our webinars are live and you can ask your instructor a question at any point during the day. All of our instructors are highly experienced and can help you. No more expensive nights away from home, no new software required, just an internet connection. Courses are run at regular intervals, so check out A320 Lounge and 737lounge.com for more details. Well, the military segment is next, of course, and uh, let's go to Nick for the first military story. OK, uh, this is from the aviationist.com uh, and it's the A10C Thunderbolt 2s, uh, better known as the Warthog uh, and the C146A Wolfhound, uh, which is some kind of Dornier twin prop thing. Uh, conducted first ever highway operations in the United States. Bit behind the drag curve, guys. We had Harriers and Jaguars doing it in the 70s, but <laughs> don't worry about that. Make a big thing, that's fine. Uh, the US Air Force operated some of its aircraft from a state highway as part of the Agile Combat Employment concept during Exercise Northern Strike 21. According to the press release, this was the first time in history that the Air Force had purposely landed modern aircraft on a civilian roadway in the United States with four A-10s and two C-146A Wolfhounds landing on the Michigan State Highway M-32 near Alpena on August the 5th, 2021. Thunder LZ gave the pilots the opportunity to land in an austere environment that they're not used to. Well, uh, the difference between a highway and a runway uh, isn't that much, I would have thought, but there you go. Uh, said Lieutenant Colonel Brian... Oh, God. <laughs> um, Brian O'God, yes. oh that's an unusual name. <laughs> yes, I thought so too. Brian uh, Wirikowski... Why, why Rzewskowski? I guess it's he's probably a, a Polish uh, origin <laughs> chap. Uh, the mission commander for Thunder LZ and a KC-135 Strata tanker instructor pilot at the 127th wing. But it's also uh, first in the nation, as this is the first time that modern combat aircraft have landed on US soil on a highway. Uh, today's training is directly applicable to what we would do during a deployed scenario, either in combat or peacetime operations, said the US Air Force uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Falcon, uh, the special tactics lead for the exercise. We're working on agile combat employment concepts, which basically makes the force more flexible, more maneuverable, and creates challenges for our adversaries in different environments. Uh, I did a story about this. Um, the Swedes were doing it in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, the Norwegians as well. I'm pretty sure the Finns uh, did this. Uh, it also increases the survivability of U.S. forces, forces as uh, we're able to move, move around a more, uh, un, to more unpredictable locations to resupply, refuel, or anything else we need. To start uh, Thunder LZ training uh, event, a team of special tactics airmen specialized in these operations infiltrated secured and controlled the airfield, which in this case was the M32 highway. Uh, the involvement of the Michigan 
uh, ANG's 127th wing might not be casual, as the unit's A-10s were the first to land on a highway in Estonia during Sabre Strike 16, 32 years after the last highway exercise. Uh, while during the Cold War, highway strips were used to get rid of the runway dependency in case of nuclear war, now they are used to operate everywhere from unpredictable locations and project combat power closer to the action quickly. Uh, the AFSOC C-146A played a key role in the training event, supporting the Special Tactics Airmen as they prepared to establish the highway landing zone. The 146A Wolfhound is the military version of the very boring Dornier 328 turboprop commuter airliner, modified to permit cargo and personnel transport missions and continuously deployed since 2011. The aircraft can carry a maximum of 27 passengers, 6,000 pounds of cargo, or up to four litter patients. What are they, cats that need the toilet? <laughs> uh, I mean, sure, right. why not? Uh, why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's go with that. So, I, actually, I think it's good that the states are catching up with, uh, you know, uh, other forces that have been doing this, uh, uh, like, 50 years ago. But, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's always been a viable option. Uh, you know, big highways that are well, um, um, have good foundations and not too many bridges overheads, that sort of thing, make an ideal alternative runway, as many a GA pilot in the United States mm. has discovered when they've run out of fuel or had some other engine problem. Indeed. And uh, uh, Rick Bell in the chat room is saying, great guys, finally doing something with the A10 that it was designed to do in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, uh, Rick. And uh, it was one of the things that I was quite surprised that during Red Flag, mm. the ATN operated, uh, let's say ATN, the A-10 operated from a dry lake bed uh, during Red Flag exercise. So uh, I, I, that I thought was great. That shows its, its ability to work from rough strips. But I guess this is a, you know, using something nice and smooth and concrete is a lot better. Uh, Mike, Mike is actually saying it doesn't seem like that much of a big, big deal to me. I bet uh, Rick uh, would land his C seventeen there. Uh, the only way this would have been an intro, it would be more interesting, is if they didn't stop traffic, which I think is probably a good point. That would have been a lot of fun, wouldn't it, if they had stopped traffic uh, but... for somebody? I'm not quite sure who. <laughs> true, true. That's a good point. Uh, well, uh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, y yeah. So the, the acronym there that is, is the AVSOC, by the way, is the Air Force Special Operations Command, if you didn't know that already. So there we go. There you go. And Richard Adams uh, says, I did a plane tale about landing an airliner. Yeah, that one had tragic consequences uh, because uh, having lost both its engines, this airliner uh, tried to land on a road and um, hit um, power um, oh gosh! Telegraph poles and broke up, and caught fire, and uh, uh, it was a huge disaster for the tiny community, uh, which suddenly found themselves with a burning airliner uh, yeah. landing on them. Not good at all. Not good no. at all. Okay, we'll move on then, if we may. And um, I think it's next. Yes, next. it's me, and uh, this is on the aviationist dot com again. And it says that a flight demonstration by Luftwaffe's Air Transport Wing 62 showcases the A400M. Well, it was a weekend of firsts for the air show fans in Michigan uh, this past Saturday and Sunday at Willow Run Airport for Thunder Over Michigan. For many air show fans, uh, this may have been the first show since the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic began and quarantines forced air show cancellations. For most air show fans, this was the first opportunity to see the US Navy Blue Angels and the US Air Force Thunderbirds at one venue on the same day. But for every air show fan in North America, this was the first time anyone would see a flight demonstration from a Luftwaffe uh, Airbus Defence A400M Atlas. 
Uh, the German Air Force had been a regular and favoured visitor to Thunder over Mich Michigan for many years. Uh, their transport units have established a rapport with the show organisers and with the fans, uh, beginning with their visits in the twin-engined C-160 Transal starting years ago. Uh, German transport units have, be, have made regular appearances at the show. This was likely a contributing factor to the decision to showcase the Luftwaffe's new Airbus A400 m atlas tactical transport at thunder over michigan this year the aircraft uh, flew to uh, willow run for the demo was in uh, united states at nellis air force base for training and exercises prior to its arrival at thunder over michigan unlike the promotional uh, flight demonstrations of the a400m atlas flown by an airbus company flight crew at the paris air shows going back to 2014 the operational luftwaffe restricts their a400m demos to performance parameters of less than 2 g's and less than 60 degrees of bank angle to conserve maintenance routines on the aircraft even with some relatively pedestrian and understand and understandable demo demonstration constraints. The German A400M crew still wowed the crowd at Thunder Over Michigan with her elegant eight-bladed scimitar-shaped propellers and her four unique sounding Europop, Europrop turboprop engines that produced an elegant low-pitched whine. I like your version, the Europop. <laughs> yes, I think it, it, it's, it's got a better sound to it, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's Thank you. I do like the sound of the A400M. And, and certainly well, when I was in Gibraltar uh, last year, they, they fly them backwards and forwards from uh, Bryce Norton to Gibraltar for all sorts of um, cargo reasons and Air Force reasons. And it's a very distinctive sound, that aircraft, isn't it? Yeah. It yeah. is. And actually, and the, uh, people will be sick of me saying this, but one of the things that I remember the most about the first time that we all met up was at Farnborough, and they um, it was it was the A four hundred M and the A three eighty, and they did a like a back to back uh, showing off of these particular aircraft at Farnborough, mm. didn't they? If I seem to remember yeah. correctly, yep. and I think we'll have we'll have to see if we can dig that out because um, uh, Captain Al did a fascinating commentary of those two aircraft as the, as they were going through the motions. Actually, we'll have to see if we can find that. Uh, I think we can find that because I think that's well worth uh, a link. As you say, it's such an iconic engine noise, isn't it? And I, I mm. wonder if that is because of the, the you know the turboprop element to it. Well, yes. No, I just I think they fit special noise makers on it. <laughs> oh, do they? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they, you, okay. If you ask them, they'll play uh, Beethoven's Ninth. Will they? Uh, right. Well, that's good to know. Instead. Right. Yeah. That's, that's very good to news. Good, good, good to know. It's, it's you know every day's a school day. Uh, it's it's a absolutely. Marvelous, but marvelous uh, that, the, to be fair, the Airbus test pilots that uh, flew their full routine in it without those restrictions that uh, mm. the German military had just did a fantastic show. Yeah. I mean, it was or mm, is yeah. a stunningly manoeuvrable aircraft and absolutely. just looked fabulous. This uh, huge transport going nearly inverted. It was yeah. incredible. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Uh, we'll move on to the next military story now. And uh, the headline, uh, so it's from the web, warbirdnews.com is the website. And the headline is Carolina's Aviation Museum to reopen in 2023. So Carolina, uh, Carolina's Aviation Museum, a Smithsonian affiliate that has served as a hub for uh, of community engagement for aviation history and STEM education in the Charlotte region for nearly three decades, today is announcing a $1.5 million gift from Charlotte-based Honeywell, uh, catalyzing uh, the launch of the public phase of the museum's largest uh, fundraising effort to date, the Lift Off campaign. Uh, the um, the gift from Honeywell, a Fortune 100 technology company that, among other industry-specific solutions, produces aerospace products and uh, services found on virtually every commercial defence and space aircraft, brings the lift-off campaign's quiet phase funding total to $10 million, including $3.5 million in additional 
private contributions from unnamed donors. The $10 million also includes an expected $5 million from the Charlotte Douglas International Airport for site development. The goal of the liftoff campaign is to raise $22 million in cash investments, plus several million dollars of in-kind support towards the creation of a state-of-the-art STEM innovation centre on airport property with construction expected to begin in early 2022 and a planned opening in 2023. Uh, the reimagined Carolinas Aviation Museum, which will be developed in partnership with Charlotte Douglas International Airport, will house dozens of aircraft and include exhibits such as an interact uh, such as interactive cockpits, flight simulators, and historic artifacts that chronicle the region's in, uh, indelible connection to the wonder of flight and aviation innovation. The new facility will be located at the site of Charlotte Douglas International Airport's historic WPA Douglas Airport hangar, which will be restored as part of the museum's project. Honeywell will sponsor uh, three key areas of the new museum. The first is a themed exhibition zone in the new main gallery known as Innovation Nation that presents the history of aviation as a testament to mankind's capability for creativity and imagination of possibilities beyond the known. US Airways Flight uh, 1549, the miracle on the Hudson Plain, will also be on display in Innovation Nation. Honeywell's 131-9A Auxiliary Power Unit, or APU, played a critical role in enabling the Airbus aircraft to touch down safely in the Hudson River uh, in the New York City on January the 15th, 2009. Honeywell is also sponsoring the uh, museum's maker... Uh, space in which youth can learn about aviation via interactive hands-on activities and a career centre which will serve as a vital resource to help students and area adults uh, connect to careers to in STEM-based industries. The new Carolinas Aviation Museum will be a dynamic cultural attraction that will connect visitors to the Carolinas' storied aviation past and elevates educational opportunities and experiences for people of all backgrounds, said Museum Board Chair Mark Oaken, who is chairing the Capital Campaign. We are humbled that donors will be able to see their dollars come to life in an immersive space that ignites creativity and inspires the next generation of aviation engineers, educators and experts. I mean, this is a. I mean, Apollo, it did sound a little bit like an advert there, but um, uh, I have to say, it's. Uh, I, well, I mean, it, for me, it sounds like a really interesting uh, thing to go and visit. I can't wait to actually uh, to to do that. And in Charlotte, I know so I know a couple of people who live in Charlotte, so it's a, even more of a reason to go and visit. Let's be honest. Absolutely. Yeah. Indeed. Nice. There we go. So, uh, so the, the final story is with you, Nick. I think, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And uh, apparently for this last military story, Armando said it was likely one uh, one of the best in cockpit videos from a US Navy plane he'd seen. Unfortunately, uh, we can't play out the whole thing because, well, uh, the language isn't entirely um, user friendly uh, because they're a bunch of sailors. And uh, so it, let's say that... Uh, you know, it's it's what gets said on a combat ship, a uh, nuclear, I might add, a combat ship, but there you go. Uh, either way, uh, we'll play out the first minute or so, but then you guys can uh, head over to our friends at thedrive.com via the link in the show notes and take a look at the written description of this S3 Viking uh, preparing to be launched from the ship and pay particular attention to the words spoken of the non-swear words sp spoken by the crew. Truly an awesome video. <laughs> Uh, these are at, uh, power levers are at like full friction. 
So I mean, you get the gist. If you want to watch the full video, it's uh, we'll make sure it's in the show notes there. But uh, yeah, it's nice. To, it's, <laughs> it's it's always a friendly exchange, isn't it, between uh, <laughs> between Towser? Who, so who who is this conversation between? Uh, th- this I think is just uh, what the crew are doing inside the cockpit. I suspect you might get their radio transmissions as well. Um, but this is for those interested in, uh, you know, how you set up an aircraft for a carrier launch, right? Uh, all the checks you go through, uh, just the cockpit procedures. And for, I mean, we're quite used to seeing this sort of thing from an airliner. Mm. Uh, it's not often we get the opportunity to see a military aircraft go through all the preparation required for a catapult launch. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's brilliant. Uh, you know, Absolutely, just fantastic to see. Well, for those of you, obviously, uh, you know, the the audio was there for a little while. But if you want to watch the whole thing, we'll make sure that the show notes are available. Uh, sorry, the link will be in the show notes for you to be able to watch the full YouTube video uh, from there. So it's it's um, uh, the the YouTube video is from G J G for G J D. Sorry. Um, is where that particular video came from. So uh, there we are. Let's make sure we did. Now we've got a bit of feedback actually from uh, one of our listeners that we'll just uh, f- uh, play before we finish. I'm frantically trying to uh, get it because I'm having a couple of minor technical issues in the studio at the moment. So just bear with me. That's always the way, isn't it? Uh, so this this is from uh, Nick Codling, very kindly sent. He said, hello, guys. A bit of, uh, a bit of quick feed- feedback for you. Sorry it's a bit late in the week, but figures that you might find it amusing. Now, there is a picture um, that I will make sure I, I pop up uh, if I can. But this is, uh, the say, the feedback from uh, Nick Codling. Hi, folks. This is Nick Codling again with some quick feedback. Uh, you can't promise I'll be on the Captain Nick levels of production values, but I'll do my best. First things first, I was watching the live broadcast last week on the YouTubes, and I was extremely shocked by the absence of one M. Smith. Was this an HR-approved absence? And will suitable deductions be made from his usual imbursements? Let's not let this happen again. Now, I've been having a few days off work, and as is usual for me, I stay up far too late, um, occasionally indulge in an adult beverage, and more often than not, look at things on the internet. Now, during the course of my browsings, I, of course, had a nose around on Flight Radar 24. 
And at this point, I'm going to transition into what is now a bit of visual feedback with some screenshots from the Flight Radar app. So apologies to the audio listeners. I happened upon a Cessna 150 flying at flight level 430 above Newfoundland, doing around 450 knots and having flown transatlantic from Stansted. Yes, that's correct. Now, I'm not an expert on type, and I don't have the operator's manual to hand, but I'm going to speculate that it would take a very large ferry tank for a Cessna 150 to fly transatlantic. And I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be doing it at 43,000 feet. And as Captain Nick himself might say, a Cessna 150 might surely only be capable of flying at 450 knots once. And even then, I'm not convinced it would be possible. Well, thanks very much indeed to Nick for that superb piece of feedback. Always nice to hear from you, Nick. And uh, thanks very much indeed. And uh, just before we go, uh, let's give you the details of how to get in contact with us, uh, which you can do on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Just search for any social media links for Plain Talking UK. Uh, our WhatsApp number is plus 44 757 224 That's plus 44 757 two two four nine one six six for your pictures comments etc uh, you can email the show at podcast at plain talking uk.com and the website is at www.plain talking uk.com you can also sub subscribe to our youtube channel where you'll get notifications where we go live and you can help shape the conversation of the show by joining us in the chat room as so many have done tonight and you can go to youtube.com and search for plain talking uk uh, or you can also use our uh, website for your Amazon shopping as well. We get a small referral free uh, fee from Amazon for doing that. And you can become a Patreon of the show as well. All of those details are on our website. And that's about it for this evening. So uh, over to you again, Matt. What, what's, uh, what's everybody up to then, Nick? I mean, obviously retirement is a, is a, a, a tough existence, no doubt. Oh, it is. I've got uh, plenty of bowling coming up Ooh. towards the end of the season. All the competitions are coming to a head, and I'm uh, looking forward to that. Um, other than that, really, no, just the usual tick over with the APG. Uh, I've got to produce a new plain tail, Ooh. so uh, just scratch my head about what to do there. No, life's uh, pretty good. And uh, I, I wish Carlos, having suffered some really bad back mm -hmm. issues over the past uh, month or so, I wish Carlos all the best mm, with absolutely. his condition and hope he gets over that soon. It can be very uh, dragging. Uh, it can pull your spirit down and make you very unhappy. Yep. So I hope absolutely. it's uh, yep. not too bad. Uh, other than that, thank you very much indeed for having me back on. Thoroughly enjoyed it as always. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing Nev again when we do our interview absolutely. with Mike Wildman. Yeah, that's going to be all a, a huge amount of fun. What about you, Nev? What's what's on the uh, agenda for you this this week? I think two major this week. No flying this week that I know of. Uh, so uh, <laughs> just in London and uh, the environs generally, I would say. Uh, but uh, no, looking forward to uh, another great show same time next week. Indeed, uh, I'm not up to much this week either. Uh, just just working basically on the radio Sunday morning. So uh, there we go. So if anybody's about at seven o'clock Sunday morning, I shall be on the radio oh too many candles he blew out uh, that's why carlos to put his back out is what lee davis is suggesting <laughs> he's probably right uh that's it uh nev thank you for being a legend as always and stepping in at short notice and nick obviously thank you so much for for stepping in with lonely and hours notice bless him oh my um, pleasure uh, love, love it thank you uh, for did you say I had time to get the t-shirt i know i mean i'm very impressed absolutely got really? a bit, bit of quality merchandise available on the website by the way uh there we go uh, that's it guys take care everyone uh have a great week and we'll catch you all at 7 p.m. Uh, if you want to catch the live show uh, next week. Take care, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.